themselves a lot of times they get so beside themselves over their teams and things and then a lot of times you come into church and we're just about to fall asleep <laughs> so I think about that and I think well Lord you know you deserve a little excitement too if we can get out there and holler for our ball team we can uh, we can shout and clap a little bit for the Lord he's a lot more important than they are but that's the way of the world today you know we live in a world we live in an entertainment driven society today and they're bent on just uh, keeping us distracted from really what's important. Uh, we're just taught, you know, whether it's the media, the news, whatever, from a child up that we're supposed to be adequately entertained throughout life. But there's more important things. There's a time and place, Solomon said, for everything under the sun. So it's for sure there's a time we need a little entertainment. They call it R&R, &R, you know. It helps you actually to unwind to get a little rest and relaxation and uh, entertain yourself. There's a place for that. But in our culture today, they're taught from children up that they're supposed to be entertained from the time they open their eyes till they close them at night. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's why kids are so wild today. Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 4. If you're using a church Bible, that's page 11, I think it's 1175. You can tell me if it, well, it is 1175, but we're picking up in verse 17. I'm not sure if that's on 1175 or not. It is, okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer if we could. Heavenly Father, we thank you today once again for having a place to come to as a church and Together around your word, we ask that you help us this morning, Father. Help us to humble ourselves and to open up our hearts and to listen, Lord, that we might hear what your spirit is saying to the church here in these last days. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we pick it up in 17 of chapter 4 this morning. Um, it says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Now, he's talking about Abraham here. That's where we left off last week. Uh, Paul was referencing Father Abraham of the Old Testament. And it says, Paul says, it's written. In other words, in the Old Testament, it was written where the Lord told Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So, a couple of real important statements are made here in verse 17. One is, uh, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. We think of Abraham and we might wonder what that means. How is it that Abraham is the father of many nations? There's two things to know here. One is, he is the father of natural nations because you remember Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and then he had 12 sons. 
who became the twelve tribes of Israel. Every tribe was a nation unto itself. So we find that Abraham was the father of many nations naturally. Also, we have to remember he was the father of Ishmael, <clears throat> which was the son of the bondswoman. And he, Ishmael went on to be a great nation. Today, when you look at the map over in the Middle East and you see all the Arab countries, they're the sons of Abraham. You know, we don't think of it like that, but that's actually a fact. Uh, Ishmael was his son too. And even when the Lord, uh, you remember when Sarah told Abraham to put the bondswoman out of the house, that that boy was not going to be heir with her son Isaac. And uh, it really tore Abraham up. You go back and read the story of the Old Testament because that was, that was his son. You know, that was his biological son. He, uh, he took the slave woman to be his wife at the request of his first and real wife, Sarah. But then later when she had a child and she saw how things were going, she became very envious and she became real upset about it. And then she finally had a son. And the Bible said that uh, when the child was being weaned at a certain age, they had this kind of uh, event, celebration of sorts, when the child you know, was weaned. And it was at that time that she caught um, Ishmael mocking Isaac. You know, Ishmael was on up in age a little bit. He was a, an older teenager, and he was mocking little Isaac there. And that's when she got furious, and she said, put her out. Put her and that child out. And Abraham didn't want to do it, you know. And, but he went to the Lord about it, and the Lord spoke to him and said, Abraham, hearken to the voice of your wife. You know, you're, the, the, the seed will be reckoned through Isaac. That's through whom the promise of God will come. So it turns out that the preparation of her heart was from God. God really did want a separation there. And there's been one ever since. Today the Jews and the Arabs are still at war with one another. There's always been an enmity there that plays out into this very day. But they are the children of Abraham. And then there's the spiritual children of Abraham, which are, is anyone who believes, anyone who has faith uh, becomes a child of Abraham according to the scriptures. So he is truly the father of many nations. The other significant thing that I noticed here in verse 17 was where it said, God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. We know in the book of Genesis from chapter 1 verse 1, he began calling into existence things that didn't exist. You know, we as human beings, we like to think of ourselves as really astute and really wise and really intelligent and really capable you know because we can take that which already exists and we can manipulate it you know we can build out of it and we can carve and we can shape and we can mold and, and we, we're very mechanically inclined you know and intellectual and we've done a lot of amazing things with God's creation have we not but still it is only God it tells us here who calls into existence that which didn't formerly exist. Now we can't do that. That's why it's foolish for a man, you know, to, to be disrespectful to God. It's foolish for a man to disclaim God. For the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And he thinks he's self-sufficient. But all he can do as a man is manipulate what God has already called into existence. A man cannot do that. In verse 18 it says, In hope he believed against hope. Still talking about Abraham. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. Now here where it says in hope he believed against hope, it's kind of a strange saying. It's, it's better rendered in the New Living Translation where it says against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. That is against all odds basically it was saying. He believed anyway against the odds. Now, when we ask ourselves what were the odds he was believing against, it tells us in the very next verse. It says in verse 19, He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was count, counted to him as righteousness. Now it says in verse 20, he didn't waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. 
Now, isn't that what we're supposed to do? You know, Abraham being our example, this verse perfectly explains what we are to do. We're not, we're not to waver in our faith. God has made us a promise just like He made Abraham a promise. This is why we're called children of Abraham if we be of the faith of Abraham. That is, saved by grace through faith. Abraham was our first example of that even in the Old Testament. It says he didn't waver, but he grew strong in his faith as he went along giving glory to God. And that's what we do. Think about it today. We grow stronger in our faith as time goes by, don't we? If we're walking the path, if we're really following the Lord. And what are we doing during that time? We're giving glory to God. We come here today so that we can grow stronger in faith as we give glory to God. And that's what it says here that Abraham was doing. It says in verse 21, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And see, that's, that's how we have to look at it. We have to be fully persuaded that God can do for us what he has promised. What has he promised? Well, he promised long ago to the Jews he would send a Messiah, a Savior, you know, who would take away the sin of the world. And then when he showed up to be baptized there with John the Baptist, John recognized him and he spoke out in front of the whole crowd and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And see, the promise was fulfilled. And so today we come along, whereas they in the Old Testament look forward to the promise, we in the New Testament, we look back to where it occurred. We look back in history and we have the scriptures that tell us it was fulfilled. And we hold to that promise like Abraham. We, we don't waver. You know, it's like I heard John MacArthur say recently. He said, uh, you know, when it comes to wavering faith, faith that isn't stable, he says it really has a lot to do with your theology. You know, and that's true. If we have the right theology, if we understand the Bible, and like I told you before, the book of Romans is probably, if not, the best book in the Bible to articulate the gospel and really, really explain it for us. And if we get this as we go through the book of Romans, if you understand it by the time we get to the end of it, your faith could never waver again. As long as you're sincere before the Lord, you'll have a proper theology of the gospel. You'll understand your salvation. There'll be no room for doubting. In verse 22 it says, That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Once again, same with us. If we stay steadfast in the faith, God looks at us as righteous. Remember, it's faith. We believe. God doesn't judge us on our performance. We, we, uh, we repent for our sins that He might help us to overcome those behaviors and work with us. But the thing is, we don't measure ourselves by that. We don't look because we've made mistakes or we've fallen weak or we have fallen to temptation and we went through a spell where we felt backslid and we did some things we shouldn't do. We don't look at that and say, well, I'm lost now. See, we look at it the way Abraham did. It's our faith. It's our faith that God looks at and counts as righteousness. He doesn't look at our performance. Once we come to God in faith and we believe the gospel and we get born again, see, if we get born again, then from then on we think of it as by faith. We realize that God is judging us by our faith. And our faith is counted to us, as it was Abraham, for righteousness. He doesn't look and say, well, you didn't perform very good the past couple of weeks. You were very unrighteous then, you know. I don't know how I feel about towards you now. He doesn't do that. God sees us from mountaintop to mountaintop, not from valley to valley. We tend to see ourselves from valley to valley. We can do real good, you know, and then all of a sudden we mess up and then we think, oh, I've I messed up again. Oh, that just reminds me of six months ago I did that. And a couple of years ago. I'm just, man, I'm just a loser when it comes to Christianity. I'm always screwing it up. We're seeing ourselves from valley to valley. But God, because of faith, because of the fit, and it's what our faith is invested in, which is the finished work of Jesus at the cross. Sin paid for in the past, the present, and the future. Which means that God sees us from mountaintop to mountaintop. The valleys are covered in His blood. See that? The valleys are covered in His blood. He doesn't look at that. See, if God 
looked at us in the valley and he felt bad toward us because we messed up, then he wouldn't be honest because he said, I will remember your sin no more. Now, somebody would say, well, Frank, that's past sins. He's not going to remember them no more. But if I commit some fresh sins, now that's different. But see, God, I remind you, He dwells outside the time domain. It all happened at once for Him. He has that kind of perspective. He sees it all at once. There is no time element when it comes to that for Him. He died for sins past, present, and future because He dwells outside the time domain. He saw all of our sins from the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of our lives. He saw it all. And He died on the cross. And He paid for it all. You see what I'm saying? So to him, it's not the future. He's already seen the future. He's already taken care of the future. So he sees us from mountaintop to mountaintop. That's good, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? It's kind of like, you know, I thought of it like this before. Uh, you can go look at some old nostalgic magazines, you know, that feature athletes. And you'll see them in their prime. They snap pictures of them, you know, at the Olympics or at some great championship. And they got them in action, you know. They got them running or they got them boxing or they got them doing something, swimming. And uh, then it gets them on, on another occasion at one of their, their, their championships or their, their athletic adventures and they've done a great thing again and they feature articles and pictures. But nobody sees the behind the scenes, you know, the struggles, the failures, and the problems. We just see the highlights and they look awesome to us, you know. We find ourselves envious sometimes and feeling small comparatively speaking. You know, a lot of times women will look at other women in these glamour magazines and it makes them feel bad about themselves. But they don't see them same women when they haven't been airbrushed on the page or when they wake up in the morning without the makeup and, you know, things like that. When they get real sick, their nose is runny and their eyes are black and everything's discolored and, you know, they don't favor at all what's on the magazine. You wouldn't recognize them. You know, the ladies don't see that. So we can get the wrong impression. But see, that's the way God, He sees, he sees us like you see them in the Glamour magazine. He sees us at our best. He sees us like we see the athletes in the magazine in the midst of their championships, accomplishing great things. God has snapshot. You know, He's taken the picture. You know, somebody might think, Frank, that just sounds kind of silly. But I, I remind you today that the Bible tells us uh, over in the book of Malachi that God listened as he heard his people talking. And he says, the Bible says he heard them talking about him frequently. And, and, and it just moved him to the point, the Bible said he made a book of remembrance for those who often spoke of him. You know, that is favorably. And it says that on the day of judgment, he will spare those people like a father spares a son. Isn't that, isn't that something? I was telling my family about that a while back. I said, you know, that's really something. I said, we're sitting here right now. You know, we were in our living room at home, and I said, we're talking about the Lord. We're talking about Him favorably. We love Him, you know. We're bragging on Him. We're talking about His goodness. I said, did you know He's making a book of remembrance right now? It tells us that in the book of Malachi. He hears this. He, it just warms His heart when He sees that and hears that. And He, he makes a book of remembrance. You know, He, he puts that... Uh, in some kind of memory, you know, whatever that would be in heaven. He put it in our language and just called it a book. But he will remember those things. So he sees us from mountaintop to mountaintop. And the blood of Jesus covers the failures if we belong to him. If we don't belong to him, it's a whole different story. But if we belong to him, that's the way he sees us. It tells us in verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now here it's telling us what I was just saying. It says that these things were not written for Abraham's sake alone, but Paul says here he's telling us this was written for our sake too that we might know that our faith is accounted to us for righteousness too, just like it was with Abraham. All right, that's it for chapter 4 actually. We're in chapter 5 now. We just had a little bit left to finish up. Let's read just a few verses and we will go into our communion service here pretty soon. Verse 1 of chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's really something. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And it tells us here that it is through Him, that is Jesus Christ, that we also obtain access. In verse 2 there. We obtain access through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at this phrase in verse 2 for a moment. Through Him we obtain access. Now, you've got to go back and understand, once again, we often we reference the Old Testament because remember, the New Testament is founded upon the Old. You couldn't have a new without an old. You know, Jesus came and He fulfilled the prophetic utterances of the Old Testament. They prophesied through the Old Testament about a coming Savior and a Messiah, and He fulfilled that. So once again, we refer back so that we might understand what's being said here. He says that through Christ, we've obtained access, access by faith into this grace upon which our faith rests, upon which salvation is obtained. See, earlier Paul told us that it was by faith that it might be based on grace. See? So we have access. We don't know, listen to me now just for a minute, we don't know how awesome that is that we have this access to God's grace unless we know what it was like before the access was granted. In the Old Testament, think about it. When God began to reveal Himself to Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt, they went by way of the mountain of Sinai and Moses went up on Sinai and he received the Ten Commandments. But if you remember, God told Moses, He said, tell the people now, put a border around the mountain. You know, when I'm up there talking to you and all this is going on, there has to be a border. And He says, you warn the people that they don't come near the mountain. Don't touch it or they'll die. See, Moses was the only one that had access at that time. And then when they established, the, uh, the, they established Jerusalem and they built the temple, if you remember, there was an Ark of the Covenant upon which the Lord's Spirit rested there on the mercy seat between the cherubims. And this golden box, it was called the Ark of the Covenant because the covenant that Moses received on the mountain while they were in the wilderness was put in this box. This is where it was stored. So it became the Ark, that is the golden box of that covenant, the Ten Commandments, Ark of the Covenant. And it was put in the Holy of Holies. The temple had three sections. It had outer courts, inner courts, and holy of holies. You know, and so in the holy of holies, it was a 10 by 10 section, a real small area compared to everything else. And only once a year, the high priest could go in there. Not even the other priests could go in the holy of holies where the ark was. Only the high priest. And that once a year to make atonement. To this day, they celebrate what they call Yom Kippur, which just means year of atonement to the Jews. He would go in there and he would wear bales. Now this is wild, but this is true. He'd wear bales because as long as they heard the bales when he went behind that curtain, see, they couldn't see him. As long as they heard the bales, they knew he was still alive. But if the bales ever stopped, they knew to drag him out of there because they would literally, they'd put a rope around him and they would tie some bales on his outfit. And if them bells stopped, they knew to start pulling that rope and just because they couldn't go in there and get him or they'd be struck dead. They couldn't look upon the ark. Only the high priest. He'd go in there and put the blood, you know, of the sacrifice once a year on the mercy seat there. And so I'm telling you this to let you know that's that was their access back then. Now compare that to now. Paul is saying because of Christ. Because Christ has entered, the Bible says, the Holy of Holies in heaven once and for all time and has sat down at the right hand of God. He's considered to be sitting on the mercy seat. Right now, the Bible says, interceding for mankind. The Bible says that the, the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. Him who accused us day and night before God. And Christ is there now. The blood is there and we've been made clean, not temporarily like in the Old Testament where it was just from one sacrifice to the next. The Bible said that the sacrifice of bulls and goats and lambs could never make those who approach the altar perfect. But the blood of Christ could. 
In the Old Testament, the blood of animals covered sin. In the New Testament, the blood of Christ eradicates sin. It's different. Covered there, eliminated here to remember our sins no more. So Paul is telling us a great thing here. We have access now. It's not separated by a curtain and a veil. You know, sometimes, you may remember this from the old days. The old timers used to call dying going beyond the veil. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? I, I saw a hand go back, go up back there with a fan in it on the other side of the curtain. Somebody's on the other side of the veil, see, behind that curtain, but I saw the fan go up. So that's what some of them called it, that they went beyond the veil when they died. And there's a lot of truth to that because in a great sense, the flesh is the veil between us and God. For the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, when this body lays down and dies, we will gain a certain uh, access to His presence that we not many people ever experience on this side of the veil, that is, in this life. But it's there. See, it's, it's kind of mysterious, but it, it makes sense if you take the time to read the Scriptures and you allow yourself to really get into it, the Lord will reveal it to you. We have access to that presence before we die. See, in the Old Testament, they truly had to die to enter into the Lord's presence like that. That flesh was a veil because it's a, it's a veil of sin. The, Paul said, in the body there dwells no good thing. He said, for how to perform that which is good, I cannot find it, Paul said. Who shall deliver me from this body of death, he said. But then he went on to say, I thank God that what we couldn't accomplish through the law, that God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, He destroyed sin in the flesh. You know, and now we have access to the Holy of Holies. See, there was a veil there in the temple, and only the high priest could go beyond the veil. But if you remember, when Jesus was crucified, what was it that was torn from the top, from the top to the bottom? Anybody remember that? When He was crucified, darkness fell across the earth, and the Bible said, the veil, that's right, Jason, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, that's a great revelation right there. You see what's going on? You don't really, we read that and we, it don't mean anything to us until you learn what that veil was for. See, God was saying when Christ died, He split that veil. And it was written in the Bible so we would know that right then and there, access to the Holy of Holies was granted. Because the veil of the temple, the Bible said, was rent from the top to the bottom. The Holy of Holies was opened up right there at the death of Jesus. Somebody didn't come in there and tear it. It was an earthquake. The Bible said darkness fell over the land when Jesus died. The earth shook. A violent earthquake occurred. And something caused the veil of the temple to be torn from the top to the bottom. And it wasn't a little sheet. You go back and read it. It was very heavy. Very heavy and thick material. Uh, it has been told, you know, and documented how thick it was. I don't remember, but it was very thick, very heavy. And that thing was torn down the middle. So today we have access to the presence of the Lord. The Bible says it like this today. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you might receive help in the time of need. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that a great privilege today? If we're saved, if we've given our life to Christ, if we've surrendered to Him and we did it from the heart, we're sincere, then we're born again and we have access to His grace. The Bible says come boldly before the throne of grace so that you might receive help in the time of need. So when something goes wrong, don't wait as a last resort to pray. Pray first. A lot of times we'll do everything else first. You know, we'll call the doctors, we'll, we'll go get the medical kits, we'll run around, you know, panicking about things and, you know, what to do. And I think we need to do that. And then when all hope seems gone, we'll just break down and cry and start praying, God have mercy. But that's what we should do first. And then go see the doctor. And then go get the, the uh, first aid kit, you know. And, and then talk to someone about what needs to take place. What's our part in this calamity or this crisis or this problem? But when anything happens, our knee-jerk reaction really should be to pray. It should be to pray. I remember one time, I'll say this as we wrap things up. Um, 
was that Angelina Kelly had the nosebleed one night. She used to have nosebleeds sometimes, and it was just too much, you know, it was kind of worrisome. And, but it was rare, and, but this time might have been the worst. Um, before this, I mean, we, we were in a car one time, and it was bleeding. We were trying to do a little missionary work, and we're going down the road, and we don't have any money at the time. We're just going by faith. And we were in the car the first time I remember it happening. And her nose began to bleed. I'm driving and all of a sudden she just breaks out and cries, you know. She's like panicking. She's crying. I'm like, what's going on, you know? And then I hear somebody else say, her, Angelina's nose is bleeding. And she's just got blood, you know, pouring down her face. And, and uh, I had been really seeking the Lord at the time during this trip we were making. And my faith was, was strong. And I remember I just declared healing right there on the spot in the name of Jesus. I, I told her to be healed and immediately it dried up and went away. And then a long time later we were staying with my parents because we did a lot of stuff like that back then. And we'd rolled into town after one of our trips or so and we were staying there at my dad's house and with my mom before they were divorced. And late one night we were all in one of the bedrooms and all of a sudden Angelina's nose began to bleed. And like I said, this time might have been the worst. I mean, it was just coming out, pouring out. I mean, it was scary looking. And she would just, poor little thing, would just start panicking. She was real little at the time, and she would start crying and just just in a frenzy, you know. And, and everybody in the room started, you know, getting real nervous about it. And, and uh, I began to pray. And somebody came in the room, you know, and, and started getting all over me. There was someone else there that come in. Well, it was, it was my mom. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you. I'm so used to concealing identities, but my mom, she, she's got dementia now. She would never hear this. and you know, I just wouldn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. But my mom got, oh, she was so upset with me. You know, She said, take her to the hospital. My dad walked in and he was going to respect my decision. He just stood there and watched to see what I would do. And her nose wouldn't stop bleeding. And my mom got angry with me. And I, you know, and I was having a hard time praying because she, you know, when somebody's standing over you, telling you you're doing the wrong thing and they're angry with you, it's a, it's hard to pray. So I just decided to stand my ground. I said, No, the Lord will heal her. She, we don't have to rush her to the hospital. He's going to heal her. And I prayed, and her nose it stopped. And within a few minutes, she was asleep, and it was all over. You know, the night uh, came back around, and it was peaceful, and everything was fine. So we, I said that to say, you know, many times over the years, I've used that access that God has given me to the throne of grace. I've gone before the Lord. Now, somebody might say, Frank, what if you prayed and her nose kept bleeding? Well, I would have taken her to the hospital. I mean, I love my daughter. I'm, I'm not insane, you know. I'm a reasonable man. But I think being reasonable is following the Lord. I think good reasoning is doing what the Bible tells us. See, and if, and if something happens and our faith ain't where it should be and it don't seem to be working, well, we need to go seek some medical attention. We need to do whatever we can do in the flesh then. But I tell you just as a, you know, a recommendation that if you believe, pray first. It's amazing what God can do. I've seen Him do many things, seen Him do miracles over the years in my life and with my family. So... We have access to the throne of grace. He said, come that you might receive help in the time of need. That was a time of need. I've had many of them. And the Lord, He's never let me down. He's helped us. And you know, if you go to a doctor or you have to take some medicine, believe still. Keep praying and believing. God will make the medicine work. Uh, I'll tell you this real quick. This is an amazing thing. I read an article where they did a study in a hospital. And they took... They took a lot of people on this side and a lot of people on this side. They made this you know, chart where they had their names and everything. And one half of the people in the hospital, they gave it to some Christians and said, pray for these people. All these people had been through surgeries and different things. And then they had this other group they put aside and they didn't pray for them. Now, the group didn't know who was being prayed for. They agreed to participate in the study, for best I remember, but they didn't tell them. It was a blind study. They didn't tell the people. They wanted to be sure nobody gave credit to positive thinking. You know, somebody sure enough later would have said, well, this group knew they were being prayed for and that lifted their spirits and positive thinking caused that to happen. They didn't know. Nobody knew who was being prayed for and who wasn't. Well, the Christian group prayed 
for the, this group. And turns out that they had a significant increase in healings and those who recovered from surgeries much faster than those in the group that didn't get prayed for. I mean, the article was very extensive and it was just amazing. And they said, you know, it, they, they basically said in so many words, you know, this is a proof. You know, we often say, and you hear preachers say, well, you can't really prove faith. You just have to believe, you know, there's no scientific proof. You're never going to be able to put it under a microscope like you do scientific things. But the fact is, this was a study conducted just like scientists conduct studies. When they do clinical studies, blind studies, they use placebos and they have all their different methods. It was a study and it was very scientific. And the results were very amazing. The people who got prayed for fared much better than the ones who didn't. So I just said that to say if we're in the hospital or we go to the doctor, you know, we still should believe because faith can give you better results from the doctor. Faith can cause the medicine to work better than it would otherwise. Do you believe it this morning? Yeah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap as we get ready to close out. I appreciate the open door in heaven. I appreciate the rent veil. I appreciate the grace that God has made available to us today. So I'm going to go ahead and call Daniel and Sahara up if I could so they can get the communion elements ready for us. Celestia, if you would kill the stage lights. Well, leave the stage lights on. Just kill the ceiling lights. Let's just take a few moments this morning and humble our hearts, quiet our spirits as we remember what the Lord did to give us that rent veil, to give us access to the grace of God. It took a great price being paid on His part. Go ahead and get Jason to come up here and officiate our service for us. For inviting me up here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With all that being said, you're all welcome to come up and receive communion now.
those who have faith and believe. I believe it's all because of faith and believing we're saved by that grace. wants to come up and uh, play us a song. That was really good this morning, by the way. All the worship service was really good. And I'll uh, close us out in prayer. and uh, take a moment to give the Lord thanks. Father God, I come to you and I ask for your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy, Lord Jesus. We live in an imperfect world and we strive to be perfect as you. I want to pray for healing and deliverance throughout the world for all those who need it, Father. Because sin has a huge price, but I'm thankful that you paid for it. You paid it all. I pray for healing and deliverance and, and your grace and your mercy, your strength. Let your spirit fill us, Lord Jesus. And give us the strength we need to go through our week and our day-to-day -day lives. And I pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. from you.